The World Spiritual Assembly does not claim copyright of this content, this is purely for informational purpose, so the broader audience can have option to listen to the U.S. Department of State's country report on Bangladesh and most importantly on the regime of fascist Hassanah regime and her gangsters. For detail country report please visit the link pasted in description section of the video. U.S. Department of State's 2020 Country Reports on Human Rights Practices, Bangladesh, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. Executive Summary Announcement Bangladesh's constitution provides for a parliamentary form of government in which most power resides in the office of the Prime Minister. In a December 2018 parliamentary election, Sheikh Hasina and her Awami League party won a third consecutive five-year term that kept her in office as Prime Minister. This election was not considered free and fair by observers and was marred by reported irregularities, including ballot box stuffing and intimidation of opposition polling agents and voters. The security forces encompassing the National Police, Border Guards, and counter-terrorism units such as the Rapid Action Battalion maintain internal and border security. The military, primarily the Army, is responsible for national defense but also has some domestic security responsibilities. The security forces report to the Ministry of Home Affairs and the military reports to the Ministry of Defense. Civilian authorities maintained effective control over the security forces. Members of the security forces committed numerous abuses. Significant human rights issues included, unlawful or arbitrary killings, including extrajudicial killings by the government or its agents, forced disappearance by the government or its agents, torture and cases of cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment by the government or its agents, harsh and life-threatening prison conditions, arbitrary or unlawful detentions, arbitrary or unlawful interference with privacy, violence, threats of violence and arbitrary arrests of journalists, and human rights activists, censorship, site blocking, and criminal libel, substantial interference with the rights of peaceful assembly and freedom of association, such as overly restrictive non-governmental organization laws and restrictions on the activities of such organizations, restrictions on freedom of movement, restrictions on political participation, corruption, criminal violence against women and girls and lack of investigation and accountability. Crimes involving violence or threats of violence targeting indigenous people, crimes involving violence against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex persons, laws criminalizing consensual same-sex sexual conduct, significant restrictions on independent trade unions and workers' rights, and the worst forms of child labor. There were reports of widespread impunity for security force abuses. The government took few measures to investigate and prosecute cases of abuse and killing by security forces. Section 1. Respect for the integrity of the person, including freedom from arbitrary deprivation of life and other unlawful or politically motivated killings. The Constitution provides for the rights to life and personal liberty. There were numerous reports, however, that the government or its agents committed arbitrary or unlawful killings. Law enforcement raids occurred throughout the year, primarily to counter terrorist activity, drugs, and illegal firearms. Suspicious deaths occurred during some raids, arrests, and other law enforcement operations. Security forces frequently accounted for such deaths by claiming, when they took a suspect in custody to a crime scene to recover weapons or identify co-conspirators, accomplices fired on police and killed the suspect. The government usually described these deaths as crossfire killings, gunfights, or encounter killings. The media also used these terms to describe legitimate uses of police force. Human rights organizations and media outlets claimed many of these crossfire incidents actually constituted extrajudicial killings. Human rights organizations claimed in some cases law enforcement units detained, interrogated, and tortured suspects, brought them back to the scene of the original arrest, executed them, and ascribed the death to lawful self-defense in response to violent attacks. Police policy requires automatic internal investigations of all significant uses of force by police, including actions that resulted in serious physical injury or death, 
usually by a professional standards unit that reports directly to the Inspector General of Police. The government, however, neither released statistics on total killings by security personnel nor took comprehensive measures to investigate cases. Human rights groups expressed skepticism over the independence and professional standards of the units conducting these assessments. In the few known instances in which the government brought charges, those found guilty generally received administrative punishment. Domestic human rights organization and Osalish Kendra, ASK, reported 196 incidents of alleged extrajudicial killings between January and July 28. According to ASK, many of these killings involved the Rapid Action Battalion, a paramilitary police force, the conventional police force, and border guards Bangladesh. In 2019 ASK reported a total of 388 incidents of alleged extrajudicial executions, down from 466 incidents in 2018. Human rights organizations and civil society expressed concern over the alleged extrajudicial killings and arrests, claiming many of the victims were innocent. In September, Amnesty International said more than 100 Rohingya refugees were victims of extrajudicial killings in the country since 2017. In Cox's Bazar, the site of Rohingya refugee camps, Rohingya comprised a disproportionate percentage of reported crossfire killings. The press reported in July that security forces killed 22 individuals, suspected mostly of conducting drug deals, in reported gunfights with police. At least 10 were Rohingya. In response to these reports, Home Minister Asaduzaman Khan refuted characterizations of the Rohingya as victims of extrajudicial killings and said they were armed narcotics smugglers crossing Myanmar into Bangladesh. After speaking with family members of the deceased, Amnesty International reported several of the killed Rohingya were picked up from their homes by the police and then found dead. On July 31, Police in Cox's Bazaar shot and killed Sinha M.D. Rashid Khan, a retired army major at a police vehicle checkpoint. Police reported Sinha brandished a gun, while eyewitnesses said Sinha had left the firearm in the car when he was asked by police to exit the vehicle. Sinha's killing generated intense public discussion on police, extrajudicial killings, and law enforcement excesses. In August the Ministry of Home Affairs convened a senior investigation committee in response to the killing, suspending 21 police officers and charging nine police officers in connection with Sinha's death. Also in August a news outlet released a Facebook video showing the senior police officer arrested, Pradeep Das, openly admitting to killing drug suspects in crossfires. In 2019 Das received the highest police award after boasting of his involvement in extrajudicial killings. In September the police administration transferred almost all 1,500 police officers in Cox's Bazaar to other posts. While the police called the transfer an administrative move, the media called this action unprecedented and observers cited in the report said the action was made as part of a corrective campaign in connection with public outcry following Sinha's death. In October media reported September was the first month since 2009 without a report of an extrajudicial killing. b. Disappearance Human rights groups and media reported disappearances and kidnappings continued, allegedly committed by security services. The government made limited efforts to prevent or investigate such acts. Civil society organizations reported victims of enforced disappearance were mostly opposition leaders, activists, and dissidents. Following alleged disappearances, security forces released some individuals without charge, arrested others, found some dead, and never found others. In a 2019 report discussing enforced disappearances, the Paris-based organization International Federation of Human Rights concluded enforced disappearances followed a pattern that included disappeared individuals previously targeted by authorities, witnesses observed similar law enforcement tactics when detaining individuals who later disappeared, and following the disappearance, authorities treated relatives either dismissively or with threats. The government did not respond to a request from the UN Working Group on Enforced Disappearances to visit the country. On March 10, photojournalist and news editor Shafiqal Islam Kajal disappeared after leaving his house for work. 
The previous day a member of parliament filed a case against Kajal and 31 others, claiming a media story covering a crime syndicate involving drugs, money and prostitution defamed the member of parliament. On May 3, police in the border town Benapol confirmed to the press that Kajal was rescued near the border with India border and detained him on trespassing charges. Kajal's family told the press they believe Kajal was forcibly disappeared and held in government detention from March through May. Kajal spent 237 days in prison on defamation charges and was released on bail on December 25. C. Torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Although the Constitution and law prohibit torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, local and international human rights organizations and media reported security forces, including intelligence services and police, employ torture and cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. According to multiple organizations, including the UN Committee Against Torture, CAT, security forces reportedly used torture to gather information from alleged militants and members of political opposition parties. Security forces reportedly used threats, beatings, knee cappings, electric shock, rape, and other sexual abuse. Numerous organizations also claimed security forces were involved in widespread and routine commission of torture, occasionally resulting in death, for the purpose of soliciting payment of bribes or obtaining confessions. According to these organizations, impunity for government actors committing torture was extensive. Politicization of crimes was a factor in impunity for custodial torture. During the government's 2019 statement to the CAT, the Bangladesh government has a zero-tolerance policy against custodial death, however, allegations of law enforcement committing torture and other forms of mistreatment were not investigated. In September a DACA court issued a verdict under the Torture and Custodial Death Prevention Act for the first time and sentenced three police officers to life imprisonment and two others to seven years in prison over the 2014 custodial death of Ishtiak Hossein Johnny. In 2019 the CAT expressed concerns with allegations of widespread use of torture and mistreatment by law enforcement officials to obtain confessions or to solicit the payment of bribes. The CAT report also cited the lack of publicly available information on abuse cases and the failure to ensure accountability for law enforcement agencies, particularly the Rapid Action Battalion. In June media reported the police's cruel treatment and extortion of university student Imran Hossein, who suffered kidney damage after an encounter with law enforcement. According to news reports, Hossein was returning home with a friend in June when police from Seji Ali camp stopped them and demanded to search their bags. Hossein ran away, leading police to chase and beat him until he lost consciousness. When he regained consciousness, police said he was arrested with cannabis in his possession. Police then released Hossein in exchange for a bribe of 6,000 taka, $71, and threatened to place him in interrogative custody if he told anyone about the incident. When Hossein returned home, his condition deteriorated and he was admitted to Queen's Hospital in Jashore, where a kidney specialist reported Hossein's kidneys had stopped working and that he would need regular dialysis. Following news reports of the incident, two Supreme Court lawyers submitted a writ petition to the High Court seeking the government take necessary action against the police responsible for torturing Hossein. In response to the High Court request, the superintendent of Jashore Police submitted an investigative report to the court, saying three police officers had taken unethical benefits from Hossein's father in exchange for releasing him from custody. The law contains provisions allowing a magistrate to place a suspect in interrogative custody, known as remand, during which questioning of the suspect can take place without a lawyer present. Human rights organizations alleged many instances of torture occurred during remand. In September the International Organization Reporters Without Borders, RSF, reported the release of news editor and journalist Faradol Mustafa after an 11-month detention following news coverage of corruption in connection with local government authorities and drug trafficking. In stories published before his detention, Mustafa's reporting alleged a connection between Technif police officer in charge Pradeep Das and local drug cartels. 
Mustafa was arrested on September 2019 and according to his wife, tortured in custody. When Mustafa appeared in court three days after his arrest, his wife said his hands and legs were broken, and the nails of his fingers and toes were pulled out. His eyesight had been badly affected by red chili powder rubbed in his eyes and he was forced to drink sewage water, causing severe diarrhea. The RSF said police planted drugs, firearms, and alcohol and pretended to discover them as grounds to keep Mustafa in jail. Mustafa was released in August, following the arrest of Das in connection with a retired army major's killing, see Section 1.A. Prison and Detention Center Conditions Prison conditions were harsh and at times life-threatening due to severe overcrowding, inadequate facilities, and a lack of proper sanitation. There were no private detention facilities. Physical conditions, according to the Assistant Inspector General of Prisons, in March more than 89,000 prisoners occupied a system designed to hold 41,244 inmates. When the first COVID-19 cases appeared in the country in March, federal authorities instituted a policy requiring prison authorities to screen all incoming inmates for symptoms and keep them in a short quarantine. Superintendents at field prisons said they had no capacity to isolate inmates infected by COVID-19. Authorities often incarcerated pretrial detainees with convicted prisoners. Officials reported only 11 prison doctors provide care to the 89,000 inmates, causing prisons to employ nurses or pharmacists to provide medical care to them. Conditions in prisons, and often within the same prison complex, varied widely. Authorities lodged some prisoners in areas subject to high temperatures, poor ventilation, and overcrowding. The law allows individuals whom prison officials designated as very important persons, VIP, to access division of prison facilities with improved living conditions and food, more frequent family visitation rights, and the provision of another prisoner without VIP status to serve as an aide in the cell. While the law requires holding juveniles separately from adults, authorities incarcerated many juveniles with adults. Children were sometimes imprisoned, occasionally with their mothers, despite laws and court decisions prohibiting the imprisonment of minors. Authorities held female prisoners separately from men. In August, three male youths died in a juvenile correction center in Jashur. Officials at the correction center said the boys were killed in a fight with other inmates, however, days after the incident, the Bangladesh National Women Lawyers Association reported allegations of torture in the correction center and demanded a separate judicial inquiry into the death. A journalist reported juvenile centers made no effort to rehabilitate youths in custody, had appointed officials not trained to handle juvenile delinquency, and treated the youths as criminals as opposed to juveniles with special needs. The investigative report found huge irregularities in providing food, medicines, and other essentials and said the youths were tortured for protesting these irregularities. In at least one instance, inmates deemed loyal were used to torture defiant inmates. Although Dhaka's central jail had facilities for those with mental disabilities, not all detention facilities had such facilities, nor are they required by law. Judges may reduce punishments for persons with disabilities on humanitarian grounds. Jailers also may make special arrangements, for example, by transferring inmates with disabilities to a prison hospital. Administration, prisons had no ombudsperson to whom prisoners could submit complaints. Prisons lacked any formal process for offenders to submit grievances. The scope for retraining and rehabilitation programs was extremely limited. Independent monitoring, the government permitted visits from governmental inspectors and non-governmental observers who were aligned with the incumbent party. No reports on these inspections were released. d. Arbitrary arrest or detention. The constitution prohibits arbitrary arrest and detention, but the law permits authorities to arrest and detain an individual without an order from a magistrate or a warrant if authorities perceive the individual may constitute a threat to security and public order. The law also permits authorities to arrest and detain individuals without an order from a magistrate or a warrant if authorities perceive the individual is involved with a cognizable offense. 
The Constitution provides for the right of any person to challenge the lawfulness of his or her arrest or detention in court, but the government did not generally observe these requirements. Media, civil society, and human rights organizations accused the government of conducting enforced disappearances not only against suspected militants but also against civil society and opposition party members. Authorities sometimes held detainees without divulging their whereabouts or circumstances to family or legal counsel, or without acknowledging having arrested them. Arrest Procedures and Treatment of Detainees The Constitution requires arrests and detentions be authorized by a warrant or occur as a result of observation of a crime in progress, but the law grants broad exceptions to these protections. Under the Constitution, Detainees must be brought before a judicial officer to face charges within 24 hours, but this was not regularly enforced. The government or a district magistrate may order a person detained for 30 days to prevent the commission of an act that could threaten national security, however, authorities sometimes held detainees for longer periods with impunity. There is a functioning bail system, but law enforcement routinely re-arrested bailed individuals on other charges, despite a 2016 directive from the Supreme Court's appellate division prohibiting rearrest of persons in new cases without producing them in court when they are released on bail. Authorities generally permitted defense lawyers to meet with their clients only after formal charges were filed in the courts, which in some cases occurred weeks or months after the initial arrest. Detainees are legally entitled to counsel even if they cannot afford to pay for it, but the country lacks sufficient funds to provide this. Arbitrary arrest, arbitrary arrests occurred, often in conjunction with political demonstrations or as part of security force responses to terrorist activity, and the government held persons in detention without specific charges, sometimes in an attempt to collect information regarding other suspects. The expansiveness of the 1974 Special Powers Act grants a legal justification for arrests that would often otherwise be considered arbitrary since it removes the requirement arrests be based on crimes that have occurred previously. Human rights activists claimed police falsely constructed cases to target opposition leaders, workers, and supporters, and that the government used the law enforcement agency to crack down on political rivals. According to news reports, between July and September government authorities arrested at least 251 returning migrant workers from Southeast Asia and the Middle East with allegations of tarnishing the image of Bangladesh. Amnesty International said the number of arrested workers was at least 370. In response to media queries, the police said the migrant workers' destination countries had requested authorities to detain the workers once they returned to the country. However, human rights groups characterized these requests as specious and said while some of the returning workers were jailed abroad, they had all either completed their sentences or had their sentences commuted due to COVID-19. Prior to their detention in Bangladesh, several of the jailed returnee migrant workers said they were victims of human trafficking in their destination country. Approximately 80 detained migrant workers received bail in October, while the rest remained in prison. On October 8, the High Court directed a DACA police station to appear before the court to explain the legal reason for the migrants' detention. Pretrial detention, arbitrary and lengthy pretrial detention continued due to bureaucratic inefficiencies, limited resources, lax enforcement of pretrial rules, and corruption. In some cases the length of pretrial detention equaled or exceeded the sentence for the alleged crime. E. Denial of fair public trial. The law provides for an independent judiciary, but corruption and political interference compromised its independence. Human rights observers maintained magistrates, attorneys, and court officials demanded bribes from defendants in many cases, or courts ruled based on influence from or loyalty to political patronage networks. Observers claimed judges who made decisions unfavorable to the government risk transfer to other jurisdictions. Officials reportedly discouraged lawyers from representing defendants in certain cases. Corruption and a substantial backlog of cases hindered the court system, and the granting of extended continuances effectively prevented many defendants from obtaining fair trials. In September the High Court ordered Brack Bank to pay 1.5 million taka, $17,705, to Hahalam, 
a jute factory worker held for three years and repeatedly misidentified as another man accused of fraud and embezzlement, for his wrongful imprisonment since two of Brack Bank's officials supplied a photo of Hahalam instead of the real accused. In delivering the verdict, the High Court cautioned the Anti-Corruption Commission to be careful in investigating inquiries and in appointing investigating officers so that similar incidents did not occur in the future. The court also expressed appreciation to the two media outlets for publishing reports on Hahalam's wrongful imprisonment. Trial Procedures The Constitution provides the right to a fair and public trial, but the judiciary did not always protect this right due to corruption, partisanship, and weak human resources. Defendants are presumed innocent, have the right to appeal, and have the right to be informed promptly and in detail of the charges against them. Defendants do not have the right to a timely trial. The accused are entitled to be present at their public trial. Indigent defendants have the right to a public defender. Trials are conducted in the Bengali language, the government does not provide free interpretation for defendants who cannot understand or speak Bengali. Defendants have the right to adequate time to prepare a defense. Accused persons have the right to confront prosecution or plaintiff witnesses and present their own witnesses and evidence. They also have the right not to be compelled to testify or confess guilt although defendants who do not confess are often kept in custody. The government frequently did not respect these rights. Mobile courts headed by executive branch magistrates rendered immediate verdicts that often included prison terms to defendants who were not afforded the opportunity for legal representation. In June the High Court ruled mobile courts could not hold trials against children. In March a mobile court accompanied by a group of law enforcement officers and magistrates in Kurigram district broke into the home of journalist Ariful Islam, beat him, took him to the deputy commissioner's office, and sentenced him to one year in prison on charges of possessing narcotics. Within days, the Minister for Public Administration said the Deputy Commissioner would be removed for irregularities in Islam's case. Legal experts called the mobile court's actions illegal because the court did not have the authority to break into Islam's home and beat him. In September the same ministry established an official committee to investigate the incident related to the illegal arrest, torture, and punishment of Islam. Political Prisoners and Detainees there were reports of political prisoners or detainees. Political affiliation often appeared to be a factor in claims of arrest and prosecution of members of opposition parties, including through spurious charges under the pretext of responding to national security threats. Police jailed opposition party activists throughout the year for criticizing the government over its actions in managing COVID-19. In February 2018 former Prime Minister of Bangladesh and Chairperson of the Opposition Bangladesh National Party, BNP, Kaleta Zia, was sentenced to five years imprisonment on corruption and embezzlement charges, which were first filed in 2008 under a nonpartisan caretaker government. In October 2018 the High Court increased her sentence to 10 years. International and domestic legal experts commented on the lack of evidence to support the conviction, suggesting a political ploy to remove the leader of the opposition from the electoral process. The courts were generally slow in considering petitions for bail on her behalf. In March the government suspended Zia's sentence for six months on humanitarian grounds, and suspended it again in September for another six months. In both instances the government restricted Zia's travel, saying she would receive medical treatment in Dhaka and could not travel abroad. On July 3, the court sentenced nine men to death and 25 men to life imprisonment for a 1994 attack on a train carrying Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, at the time she was the leader of the opposition party. The convicted persons were all BNP members. BNP Secretary General Mirza Fakhrul Islam Alamgir condemned the verdict and said the case was fake and fabricated, alleging the Awami League had staged the attack. Civil Judicial Procedures and Remedies Individuals and organizations may seek judicial remedies for human rights violations, however, lack of public faith in the court system deterred many from filing complaints. While the law has a provision for an ombudsperson, one had not been established. 
In September a DACA court sentenced three police officers to life imprisonment and two others to seven years in prison over the 2014 custodial death of Ishtiak Hossein Johnny. The convicted were also fined, funds payable to Johnny's family. This was the first verdict under the Torture and Custodial Death, Prevention, Act, 2013.